Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome to this video looking at the lab exercise Paleozoic Orogenies of North America. So in this lab exercise what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using geologic maps to investigate how geologists begin to work out when orogenic events have occurred. And so we're going to be focusing uh, on maps from the east coast of the United States and we are going to be using them to try and work out some general timings for orogenic events that we have already discussed within the lecture materials. Now, if you remember, the Paleozoic was a very active time, especially for the eastern coast of North America, which was at the time referred to as Laurentia. So during the Paleozoic era, there were six main continental masses. So there was Baltica, which is modern day Western Russia and Scandinavia. There's China, which is modern day China and mainland Southeast Asia. There was Gondwana, which is modern day Africa, South America, Australia, India, Antarctica, Madagascar, parts of the Middle East, parts of Southern Europe and Florida. There was Kazakhstania, which is modern day Central Asia. There is Laurentia, which is modern-day North America, Greenland, Ireland, and Scotland. And there was Siberia, which is modern-day Russia, east of the Urals, northern Kazakhstan, and Mongolia. So these six continents were obviously all moving relative to each other. Um, and in between them, there were also several smaller microcontinents. And arguably, when it comes to the development of Laurentia during the Paleozoic, uh, the most important microcontinent is Avalonia because that's going to be involved uh, in the collision when we have uh, Laurentia and Baltica coming together. We have Avalonia coming in at the same time, and this is going to, of course, lead to the Taconic Orogeny. Now, um, when we are talking about the modern day east coast of the United States, and I should also add Canada. What we are referring to is what was the south coast and southeastern coast of Laurentia. So at the uh, during that time period, uh, North America, or Laurentia as it was, was rotated approximately 90 degrees clockwise from its current position. So what is modern day northern North America was approximately orientated to the east. What is modern day eastern North America was approximately orientated to the south. And so what's going to happen as we progress through the Paleozoic is there is going to be a steady rotation of North America. And this is going to be particularly strong towards the end of the Paleozoic. And you, 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 get, uh, you get Laurentia slowly rotating more and more towards its current orientation. And this will continue all the way through the Mesozoic. And by the time you are in the Triassic, North America is approximately orientated in its current alignment. Now, because we are going to have uh, four major orogenies during the Paleozoic, this is obviously going to lead to the development of elevated terrain. And these areas of elevated terrain are, are referred to as highlands. They're also referred to as orogenic belts. So think of an example like the Rockies or the Andes. So those would be good examples of modern orogenic belts, which are also referred to as highlands in some cases. Now, of course, these highlands, which are being produced by convergent tectonism, are going to result in the formation of quite significant amounts of sediment because elevated terrain will weather faster than the relatively more depressed terrain either side. So whenever we have a uh, orogenic event producing a highland region, you are going to get elevated rates of erosion and large amounts of sediment being deposited. Now, because these highland areas are associated with convergent plate boundaries, one side of the highlands is going to be an active plate boundary. So you are going to have a situation where you have a subduction taking place. It's going to be tectonically very complicated. There's going to be lots of uh, blue schist grade metamorphism, so quite high pressure, low temperature metamorphism taking place. And so any sediment that falls on the seaward or subduction 
side of the Highlands is just going to get incorporated into the plastic wedge located in front of the Highlands and it's just going to get all mixed up in, in the melange. Now, on the back side of your Highlands, you are going to have a more passive environment. And the sediment that moves into that area is going to be deposited either over a plain or it's going to be deposited into a small ocean basin. And so obviously what you're going to end up with is a situation where you have a lot of tectonic deformation combined with large amounts of sediment being deposited on the landward or backside of the highland uh, terrain. And the combination of the tectonic deformation and the weight from all of this added sediment will often cause the crust located behind the highlands in, in this passive area to begin to subside. So the crust will literally begin to sink. And obviously, as the crust begins to sink, this will result in a topographic low. And topographic lows are one of the prime locations for both water and more sediment to gather. And so what will happen is you'll develop this topographic low or begin to fill with sediment. The weight of the sediment pushes the crust down further, you know, which allows the topographic low to be maintained. So more sediment gets deposited and so on. And so what will happen is you will develop a buildup of sedimentary material, which is referred to as a clastic wedge. And this is related to you know, the erosion of the highlands. Now, it's referred to as a clastic wedge because it's dominated by clastic sedimentary rocks, and they will typically be of a, uh, a larger class size the closer you are to the highlands. So when you're proximal to the highlands, you will typically find you will have conglomerates as you move away. You may transition into sandstones, and as you move further, you will then transition into mudstones. And you will see these transitions if the sediment is being deposited into water or if it's being deposited onto land as well. Now, in the case of water, you will tend to get a slightly better definition. So you'll get uh, conglomerates, then you'll get marine sandstones, then you'll get marine mudstones, and maybe you might even get some carbonates uh, very distally to the highlands. In the case of the sediment being deposited onto uh, exposed crust, so essentially onto the continent, you will once again end up with a situation where you will have conglomerates being deposited uh, closer to the uh, the highlands and then you'll have a situation where because you have elevated terrain this is obviously going to lead to the formation of rivers and so of course these rivers are going to transport the sediment they can transport so mostly sand and mud size class and they're going to transport that away from the highlands and you're going to end up with the same gradation going from conglomerates closest to the highlands grading into more sand dominated sedimentary rocks and then eventually moving into more mud dominated sedimentary rocks. Now the reason it's referred to as a clastic wedge is because the majority of the sediment that's being deposited as the highlands get eroded will be deposited proximal so next to the highlands and so this means that the majority of the sediment is being deposited right next to the highlands and so that means that that's there's going to be more mass there which is going to be down warping that crust pushing it down helping to maintain this uh, this basin that's forming and so you're going to end up with a really thick sequence of sediments located closest to the highland and then as you move away from it, you're going to see this uh, sequence of sediments become narrower and narrower and narrower, and it creates a wedge shape. So that explains the name clastic wedge. Now, there will be several uh, clastic wedges created uh, due to each of the tectonic events experienced by the east coast of the United States. So if you remember, uh, during the Paleozoic, the eastern coast of the United States is going to be affected by the Taconic orogeny, the Acadian orogeny, the uh, Washitaran orogeny, and the Alleghenian orogeny. And so these are obviously, each of them is going to create a new set of highlands, which is going to be eroded, which is going to lead to a new burst of sediments being produced and deposited into the surrounding area. So as previously mentioned, these four orogenies are the result of convergent tectonism. So convergent tectonism is obviously the result of subduction, which is a process by which we are destroying oceanic crust. 
And so the presence of the subduction zones along the modern day eastern coast of North America will obviously lead to the collision of the modern day east coast with other continents, microcontinents or island arcs. And obviously this is going to reduce the erogenies that we observe. Now, in the case of the Taconic and the Acadian orogeny, the subduction is destroying the Iapetus ocean basin. So in the case of the Taconic orogeny, what we're looking at is the closure of the northern and central portion of the Iapetus ocean basin, and the Acadian orogeny is the closure of the southern portion of the Iapetus ocean. And so this is going to lead to Laurentia, uh, suturing or getting stuck to Baltica and Avalonia, and this is going to lead to the formation of the landmass Laurasia. Now, in between Laurasia and Gondwana, you have another ocean basin, which is the Rheic Ocean Basin, and the closure of this ocean basin is going to lead to the uh, Washitan and Alleghenian orogeny. So as the Rheic Ocean Basin is destroyed and these two very large land masses, Laurasia and Gondwana move towards each other, that's going to be the Rheic Ocean Basin being destroyed and eventually it's going to lead to the collision that results in the uh, Washitan and the Alleghenian orogenies. And obviously it's also going to lead to the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. So during the Paleozoic era, the modern day east coast of North America was very tectonically active. In contrast, the modern day core of North America and the modern day west coast were comparatively tectonically passive. There wasn't a lot of deformation taking place during the Paleozoic era. Now, this means that these environments are going to be primarily controlled by sedimentary processes when it comes to what we see in the rock record. Now, we know that during the Paleozoic, there were several global uh, marine transgression and regression events. So we have global sea level rising and falling. Now, what's going to happen when we have global sea level rising is obviously we're going to have seawater moving onto the continental crust. And this led to the formation of quite extensive Epiric seas during the Paleozoic that at times covered a very significant uh, proportion of Laurentia. Now, obviously, the Epiric Sea is typically defined as having a much shallower water depth than regular ocean basins. And of course, the Epiric Sea itself is underlain by continental crust versus a normal ocean basin where the, uh, the body of water is underlain by oceanic crust. The development of these Epiric Seas is a reflection of changes in global sea level during the Paleozoic. Now, changes in global sea level are typically driven by two variables on the whole. The first one is the temperature in the polar regions. So typically, when your polar regions get cooler, you will tend to get ice formation, and this will, of course, lock up water, meaning that it cannot enter the ocean basins. And so we tend to see global sea levels dropping during periods when the polar regions get colder. Conversely, once these polar regions begin to warm up, we're going to see that ice melting. This is going to lead to water re-entering the ocean basins and you are going to see a sea level rise in response. And obviously we know that these Epiric seas are related to rising global sea levels, which allows the ocean to move onto the continents. Now, the other variable that needs to be taken into account are the positions of the continents. Uh, that's typically a controlling factor because it is easier to form extensive ice sheets on continental crust versus open seawater. So typically, if you have a large continental mass located in one or both polar regions, combine that with slightly cooler temperatures in these polar regions, you are going to get much larger ice sheets forming. So these changes in polar temperatures combined with the position of the continents will lead to these changes in global sea levels, which will uh, be reflected in the formation and retreat of these Epiric seas during the Paleozoic. Now, in terms of the Epiric seas that went and affected North America during the Paleozoic, we had the soak. This started in the Cambrian and went through to approximately the early to middle Ordovician. 
That was then followed by the Tipper Canoe that started in the Middle Ordovician and went through till about the end of the Silurian. Then we have the Kaskaskia that started forming in the early Devonian and went through to about the end of the Mississippian. And then we had the development of the Absaroka, which was starting towards the end of the Mississippian, start of the Pennsylvanian, and that went all the way through to the Middle Jurassic. Now, once these Epiric seas went and formed, uh, the position of Laurasia during these time periods was mostly equatorial or near equatorial. And so this would have meant that these Epiric seas would have formed in what is a relatively warm environment. And so you can imagine a situation where you have these shallow seas, nice warm water. You would expect to get carbonate formation in these environments, providing there isn't too much sediment coming into the Epiric Sea. So the amount of sediment that was entering these Epiric Seas is a reflection of the size of the highlands, which are present at the time, because obviously when you have an orogenic vent going on, you're going to get elevated topography forming. This is going to lead to the creation of large amounts of sediment, which is then going to enter the Epiric Sea if it's present. Obviously, the more clastic sediment you have coming into your Epiric Sea, the cloudier that water will be, and therefore the chances of carbonate formation is going to decrease because carbonate formation tends to occur most efficiently with nice clear water. The other factor that's going to control the amount of clastic sediment coming in is how much of the continent is exposed and how much is covered by the Epiric Sea. So during periods where we have the Epiric Sea covering an ex, you know, quite extensive portion of uh, Laurentia or later Laurasia, so we're talking about the Soak and the Tippecanoe maybe, uh, in those situations these Epiric Seas were quite extensive, most of the continental crust was covered over, and so this meant there wasn't much continental crust to be eroded, so there was relatively little sediment actually entering these Epiric Sea basins. Compare that to the Absaroka, which, uh, during which the uh, Pyrrhic Sea wasn't quite as extensive. This meant that you had more continental crust exposed, and so this led to more clastic sediment entering your Pyrrhic Sea, thereby reducing the water quality somewhat, and that's obviously going to lead to a, a, a lower chance of forming extensive carbonate deposits. Regardless of which of the Epiric Seas we're talking about, so the one that formed the Soak sequence, the one that formed the Tipicanu sequence, the one that formed the Kaskaskia sequence, or the one that formed the Absaroka sequence, the coastal regions, so the margins of the Epiric Sea, would have tended to be sediment dominated, so there would be more clastic sediment in those regions. And then typically as you moved away from the marginal regions and into the toward the center of the Epiric Sea, you would have found the water quality improving and therefore the chance of carbonate formation increasing. So even in the case of the Absaroka sequence, the Absaroka Epiric Sea, which was very clastic sediment dominated, there were a lot of fine grained sediments going into it, so lots of silts, lots of clays, this would have led to a uh, quite cloudy water quality throughout most of the Epiric Sea. Even in situations like that, as you move towards the center of the Absaroka Epiric Sea, you would have found regions where the amount of clastic sediment would have dropped to a low enough point where the water quality was good enough to allow carbonate formation. So think of a classic example. The, uh, probably the best modern example at the moment would be the Caribbean islands. In that instance, you have a nice warm body of water. You have relatively small pieces of crust exposed. And so because you have these relatively small islands compared to the overall size of the Caribbean Sea, you have relatively little sediment coming into the sea from the erosion of these islands. And so this typically leads to quite good water quality. And this helps to encourage the formation of limestone deposits, or at least carbonate deposits, should I say, which will eventually turn into limestones. Okay, so let's move on to part one of the lab exercise. So in part one, the lab exercise, we're going to start looking at geologic maps and we're going to try and start using the evidence on them to date the approximate timings of some orogenies that have affected the eastern coast of North America during the Paleozoic. Now, 
As already touched upon, these orogenic events are the result of convergent tectonism, typically ocean continent or continent continent convergence. And of course, this is going to lead to the collision of large pieces of crust. This is going to produce a lot of compressive stresses, and it's also going to lead to some heating. And we're going to see the result of these compressive stresses in the formation of elevated terrain, so mountains or highlands. Now, this isn't the only change that's going to be produced by these orogenic events. And so we're going to look and think about some of the other changes that we would expect to see occurring due to this compressive stress and associated heating. One of the first things you'll notice when you look at a geologic map that's been affected by an orogenic event is that the rocks will be deformed. And this deformation is typically expressed in the formation of anticlines and synclines, so folding. Now, the timing of this deformation can be inferred based on the rocks that have been deformed. So let's imagine a situation where we have a orogenic event taking place in the Silurian. Obviously, that pressure from the orogenic event can only affect rocks which are already present in the area being deformed. So if we have Precambrian rocks, Cambrian rocks and Ordovician rocks, they will be deformed by the compressive event, the orogeny which is occurring in the Silurian. Now on top of that, if we know when the orogenic event occurred and we can time it quite well, so let's say it occurs in the late Silurian, we may also see deformation of rocks which were deposited and formed in the early and middle Silurian as well. So in some cases you can have rocks which formed in the same period as the orogenic event also being deformed by that orogenic event. We can also use the orientation of the anticlines and synclines that were produced by the orogenic event to give us some idea about its orientation. So typically anticlines and synclines will form at 90 degrees to the compressive stress. So if you imagine we have an orogenic event where we have two continents moving towards each other and one is moving from the north and one is moving from the south and they end up hitting each other and producing an orogeny. Well, in that instance, the compressive stress is going to be orientated north-south. The anticlines and synclines that will form in response to this compressive stress will therefore orientate themselves at 90 degrees to it, so approximately east-west. And so when we look at a geologic map and we see anticlines, we can look at them and say, right, the general trend, the orientation of this anticline is, let's say, uh, northeast southwest that would suggest that based on the modern orientation the orogeny that formed them was actually northwest southeast and so you can quickly see how by looking at the age of the rocks that have been deformed and the orientation of the deformation you are starting to get an idea of when the deformation occurred and in what direction the deformation was happening so the next change that we would expect to see would be faulting of pre-existing rocks. So once again, the faulting can only affect rocks which are present before the orogeny begins. So if we think back to our, Sil our Silurian Age orogeny, well, we know that therefore any faulting related to that orogeny can affect rocks which were formed in the Precambrian, the Cambrian, or the Ordovician. Now, Typically, when we look at the faults themselves, the most common fault we're going to see will be thrust faults and reverse faults. So we have sheets of rock being pushed one on top of another due to the compressive stresses. Now, these faults themselves will also give us some idea about the timing of the orogenic event because we know they can only have cut rocks which were already present. So when we see Precambrian, Cambrian, or Division age rocks cut by thrust faults, we know that the orogenic event must have occurred after the Ordovician, so it must be Silurian or younger. The other thing we can do is we can look at the orientation of the trend of these strikes of these uh, thrust faults. So if you imagine a situation where once again we have our two continents coming towards each other, one from the north and one from the south, so the northern one is moving to the south, the southern one is moving to the north, and eventually we have our orogeny when these two pieces of crust meet and smash into each other. 
in that instance, you are going to get the formation of thrust faults. So you're going to have sheets of rock being pushed one on top of another. And when we look at the orientation of these faults, the trend of them, we're going to see that they are striking parallel to the orogenic front. So we know that our orogenic front is orientated east-west because we've got our continent coming from the north, our continent coming from the south, and they smash into each other. So that means that the line along which they're meeting, the orogenic front, is orientated east-west. When we look at these thrust faults, we are going to see the strike of them is also going to be approximately east-west. So once again, just like the deformation, we can use faulting as well to give us some idea of when the erogeny occurred, and it also gives us some idea of the orientation of the erogeny. I should point out once again that the orientation that we're getting is based on the current orientation of the rocks because this is geology they've been around for millions of years there may have been rotations taking place so we know that between the paleozoic and the present day we know that north america underwent a approximately counterclockwise rotations this is obviously going to affect the orientation that we see of the deformation in the present day versus when it actually occurred in the paleozoic now, another thing that we're going to see associated with the formation of these highlands is unconformities. So during the orogenic event itself, we end up with elevated terrain, and this elevated terrain is going to suffer higher rates of erosion. And this will lead to the formation of unconformities. And so there's a couple of ways in which these unconformities can form. So the unconformity can be a be the result of a period of non-deposition. So in that instance, you have uplifted terrain where you have few to no sedimentary rocks forming. And that's to be expected because you are dealing with a situation where sediment will typically be removed from the elevated terrain and deposited around the surrounding area. And so this means you're not going to get sediment being deposited in your area of elevated ground. And so you aren't going to get any new sedimentary rocks forming. So you're going to get a hiatus in sedimentary rock formation. It's going to stop because there's no sediment being dropped. Uh, another thing that you'll see, and this is arguably the more common cause of unconformities related to erogenies is that because you have uh, elevated terrain you have these increased rates of erosion you're going to have rock being destroyed and so typically what you will see is if we go back to our silurian uh, aged um, orogenic event you may see any uh, any silurian age rocks which were present before the orogenic event they'll be eroded away you may see Ordovician rocks being eroded away, and you may even see Cambrian or even Precambrian rocks being eroded away due to the elevated terrain. And so the appearance of these unconformities and the timing of them helps to give us some idea of when the ground was being elevated and therefore being eroded. So the presence of these unconformities offer us a window into the timing of the orogenic event that produced them. So the next change that we would expect to see related to orogenic events is intrusions. So typically during a compressive tectonism, you can have a couple of things happening. You can end up with subduction in the case of an ocean continent subduction zone. So the oceanic crust is going to go down into the mantle. It's going to start melting. The resulting mafic magma is going to rise up. It's going to get stuck at the base of the continental crust and it's going to start to melt the continental crust and this is going to lead to the formation of intermediate and felsic magmas which will then intrude the crust and we'll see those reflected in the uh, presence of tonalite and granite intrusions and so we can date these intrusions using numerical dating methods and that really helps us to narrow down when the orogenic event was occurring Another situation is if we have a continent-continent collision. In that situation, what can happen is the crust itself can become thickened due to the formation of the highlands. And if that thickening is sufficient to cause the temperature in the lower crust to get to a high enough point, that can then lead to the melting of the lower crust. And this will typically lead to the formation of felsic magmas, uh, which we will see in the form of granite intrusions. 
So the presence of these intrusions on our geologic maps are going to give us some idea of the timing of our orogenic event. Now, another thing that we might keep an eye out for is the presence of mafic intrusions or mafic rocks. Now, these are typically related to divergent tectonism, so when your plates are moving apart from each other. So when we start seeing rocks like gabbro, when we start seeing rocks like diabase and basalt beginning to appear within our geologic maps, that's typically a hint that we may be seeing a shift from convergent tectonism to divergent tectonism. And this is something that we are going to see when we look at a few of these geologic maps. You are going to see that, you know, even though the map itself is, you know, focused on uh, Paleozoic uh, compressive tectonism, there will be some indicators of divergent tectonism that's happening during the Mesozoic as well. And I'll try and point those out as we go along. Now, the final thing that we will see associated with the formation of highlands produced by an orogenic event is changes in metamorphic grade. So we're going to get metamorphic rocks forming in response to the pressure increases and temperature increases due to the orogenic event. So if you imagine you have the formation of your highlands, well, that's quite a big body of rock. So the rocks which are located within the core of your mountainous terrain, your highland terrain, they are going to be under very high pressure and quite high temperatures. And so this is going to lead to the formation of high to moderate grade metamorphic rocks, typically foliated metamorphic rocks as a member that compressive stress is going to make minerals orientate themselves and we're going to see that in the formation of a foliation within our metamorphic rocks now as you move away from this core region of your highlands and you start to move towards the margin of your highlands typically compressive forces and also the temperature will begin to eventually decrease and so as you move towards the margin of your highland environments you are typically going to see a change towards more moderate and low grade metamorphic rocks they will also be foliated though because of that compressive stress even then it's going to be causing the minerals to align and then eventually as you move even further away from your highland region you are going to move into rocks which are unaffected by metamorphism related to the orogenic event so what geologists can do is we can look at the timing of the metamorphism. That's going to give us some idea of when the orogeny was happening. So which, rock, which rocks have been affected by metamorphism and which rocks have not. So we can say, right, we have our Silurian orogeny again. We can see that the early Silurian rocks, we can see that the Ordovician, the Cambrian, and the Precambrian rocks have been affected by compressive metamorphism. So we've produced foliated metamorphic rocks that's going to give us some idea of when the orogeny happened and then when we look at the rest of the rocks in the area so we see that the late silurian rocks and then moving into the devonian and then into the pennsylvanian and the mississippian so the carboniferous we see that those rocks are not affected by metamorphism well that would suggest that therefore the event that produced the metamorphism occurred during the late silurian and was over by the time you moved into the devonian the other thing you can do is you can use it as an approximate guide to where the orogenic event was taking place. Where were the highlands? So when you look at a geologic map and you look at the metamorphic rocks, you will typically see the grade of them getting higher as you move towards your highland area, your mountainous terrain. And they'll typically be the highest grade as you're moving into that core region of your mountainous terrain where the pressures and temperatures are going to be at their highest. And so you might see a transition from relatively low grade metamorphic rocks and minerals steadily going to moderate and then into high grade. And so we can use these changes in the metamorphic minerals to say, right, this is the approximate location of our orogenic front of our mountain range. And this is the process that we use to actually locate them, because if you think about it, the mountain ranges that formed in the geologic past have been completely eroded away. They're no longer there. You can't see them. There's no topography associated with them. However, geologists can come along and they can look at the metamorphic rocks and they can say, ah, oh, well, there was clearly a compressive event here. And then they can use the grades of those metamorphic rocks to work out exactly where 
this compressive event occurred. So what was the location of the front and what was its orientation? And so you can see that there are lots of things which will affect the rocks of an area during an orogenic event. And a lot of these will be visible to us on and in geologic maps. And so we can use the evidence in these geologic maps to begin to get an idea of the timing of the orogenic events that have uh, influenced the geology of a particular area. Okay, so this is going to be a good place to stop. So please get up, have a walk around, get yourself a glass of water, and then return for part two when we are going to begin the analysis of the rocks uh, located in the Danville Quadrangle of Virginia.